So before we do anything else, this being a men's session and all, <clears throat> I thought it would be appropriate to share with you the time that I felt least like a man, all right? A couple of years ago, a good friend of mine, Todd, from Canada, came and visited me in Australia. Now, where I live in South Australia, we have the highest concentration of white pointer sharks on the planet. Those are the ones that kill you, all right? So, you know, like a couple of times a year, you'll hear about someone in the papers. Some unlucky bugger had his arm taken, his leg, his head. I don't know, hard to recover from that one. And um, so you, you're always a little nervous, you know, when you go surfing or you're out on the beach. And my dad would say, mate, you got more chance getting struck by lightning. That didn't help. I was just afraid of getting killed by a shark and struck by lightning. And, um, but because I was the Australian, I had to pretend like, you know, I was in charge, cool, calm, and collected, as they say. So my friend Todd would be like, are you sure there's no sharks here? I can't do the accent. I'll try. Are you sure there's no sharks here? Here. <laughs> I don't have the muscle in the tongue that produces the R sound, right? You sure there's no sharks here? I went, mate, don't worry about it. But secretly, I'm a little afraid. We road tripped from Adelaide to Melbourne along what's called the Great Ocean Road. Real beautiful spot. Every beach we saw along the way, man, we would just run down. Love and life, you know, on the beach, like those kids from One Direction, except manlier. And um, we'd play in the water and stuff. And we went to this uh, pub that was overlooking the ocean. And just to put Todd's fears aside, I went up to the bloke behind the counter. A bloke is a guy. That's the question. I said, g'day, mate, here you go. I said, has there been any shark sightings lately? No joke, this is what he said. It's fair dinkum, true story. He said, oh, no, nah, mate, not since six this morning. <laughs> six this morning, he said, yeah. Right, no, that's, that's, that's a long time, Todd. What are you worried about, you clown? So, we're at this one beach, and it's beautiful. Man, like white sand, crystal clear uh, water, you know, beautiful waves. You can see down to the ocean floor. We're loving life. And at one point, I look down and I see a stingray. That freaked me out because, you know, that killed Steve Irwin. You know, and so people will say, Sting, stingray won't bloody hurt you. What chance do I have if Steve Irwin was killed by one, you know? Um, and Todd at one point said, Are you sure there's no sharks? I mean, there's no one on this beach and it's beautiful. Maybe we missed the sign. I said, Don't worry about it. About 10 minutes later, this is a true story, man. My friend Todd was where that wall is, right? That white wall, he's standing there. And all of a sudden, I start hearing him freak out like a girl. And Todd's, you know, he's kind of buff, you know? He's, uh, so this makes it all the funnier when I looked over and saw him doing this. Ah, ah, ah! <laughs> Splashing an animal that lives in the ocean. So I look over and him... And then about, you know, 20 meters in front of him, I see two shadows under the water. And it was like they were coming at him really fast. So it wasn't like, oh, it was just a reflection of the clouds. I knew absolutely that this was something coming for Todd. Now, this is the part of the story I wish I could change. I always say, I wish I, wish I could say this. So what I did was <laughs> swam over there. Push Todd out the way, punch the shark in the nose. Am I a hero? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's not what happened at all. I just saw the shark thing and I was, ah! and I swam as fast as I have ever swam to the beach, you know? So I'm laying on my chest, you know, it's not coming down to my nipples, wedgie. <laughs> couple of minutes later, Todd comes in, not minutes, maybe seconds, I forget, and he's got his arms and his legs and his head, so that was good. That would have freaked me out. <laughs> anyway, um, we had just survived this traumatic experience together, you know, so it was one of these real bonding moments, you know, where it's like, <laughs> you know, how do you cry and still try and seem like a man with a wedgie and snot coming down to your nipples? This is how it goes. <laughs> That's sort of how it looks, in case you were wondering. <laughs> anyway, at, at this point, we look over our shoulder and we see two dolphins. <laughs> Just, 
Just, um, up, 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 up. What, I don't know what sound they make. What are they? Mm, I don't know what they. Like, dude, they just want to play with us. I was said to Todd, oh, they're just, just dolphins. <laughs> Todd's like, should we go back in now or later? How about never again? How about that option? There's going to be two halves to today's talk, all right? In the first half, I don't want to teach anything explicitly. Rather, what I want to do is ask questions and tell stories in order to stir up and awaken desire within us, to show us that who we desire to be in our heart of hearts as men is in fact the same man God is commanding us to be. In other words, God's commands don't require us to deflate our desire, but rather they call for expansion. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory said, when we consider the unblushing promises of reward in the Gospels, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink, sex, and ambition, while infinite joy is being offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer to vacation at sea. We are far too easily pleased. And then in the second half of this talk, what I want to do is lay down five rules that I think every man needs to break. If he is to be the man he desires to be and the man God is commanding him to be. Okay? Cool? Let's begin with a question. And when I ask this question, I don't want you to merely hear me asking it. I want you to reflect upon it in your own self, okay? What kind of man do you want to be? And again, please don't think, oh, what I should want to be, you know, what Jesus would probably have me be, what my youth minister. Please don't think that. Just be brutally honest. What kind of man do I want to be? I'll ask you another question and think about this. What kind of men do I respect? They can be fictional, non-fictional, dead, alive, I don't care. What kind of men do I respect? Finally, I think another question that gets us to the heart of what I'm trying to get at. How do I want to be remembered when I'm dead? All right. 20 years from now, 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, it's pretty fair to say that all of us or most of us will be in the ground, right? Or we'll be, you know, if we're buried, they'll throw us in the ground and they'll speak no more about us than we now speak about those who have gone before us. They'll say, oh, God rest him, but that's it. They won't think about you anymore. But at your eulogy, when someone stands up to speak about you, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want them to say of you? Undoubtedly, I mean, there's like a thousand men in here, right? So there's a variety of answers. We didn't all think the same thing or the same things, perhaps. But I am willing to bet that no one in here thought to themselves... Dude, I want to be the kind of guy who never stands for, up for what he believes in, you know? Or I want to be the kind of guy who can cheat on his wife so her and the kids don't find out. I, I want to be remembered as like a player, basically, you know? We don't think that. And wherever I've given this talk, it hasn't always been to Christian audiences. It's been the same. And the reason that is, I'm willing to bet, is that we know innately what constitutes authentic masculinity and what doesn't. We know the counterfeit and we don't want the counterfeit. We know we want to be men. When I think of the question, what men do I respect? I immediately think of St. Maximilian Kolbe. 
For those of you who don't know, Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish Franciscan priest. We had a Franciscan up there who had an epic bag. Where is he? Stand up, please, Father. Yeah, do you like that? I planned all of that. You're welcome. Anyway, see, Franciscans are very humble, and this is why. Franciscans look like Jedi Knights, basically. (laughs) And instead of lightsabers, they've got rosaries that could kill a small cow, you know? Strangle it or something, I don't know. But So, Maximilian Kolbe was this Polish Franciscan priest, lived during the Second World War. And when the, you know, the Nazis turned their gaze upon Poland, he actually provided shelter for people in the greater Poland area, including 2,000 Jews who he hid in his friary, all right? In 1941, the German Gestapo arrested him and took him to the Powiak prison at Warsaw. And he was thrown into the cell with one other man, and it's from him, I believe, we get this story, all right? So Maximilian Colby's standing there, again, with the large rosary, just a symbol of faith. And a guard walks past, and outraged at this symbol of faith, as many are today. And he snatched at Maximilian Colby's rosary. He said, do you believe in this? Held it in his face. Apparently, Maximilian Colby said, yeah, absolutely, I do. (laughs) I don't know if he said it like that. Yes, so I do. But he said, absolutely, I do. And he took a blow to the face, knocked him back. A second time, he was asked, do you believe in this? Again, he said, as calm as he did the first, absolutely, I do. And he was struck again. A third and final time, do you believe in this? Absolutely, I do took a blow to the face, fell to the ground. The prisoner who was in the cell with him said, if it wasn't for the welts arising on his face, you wouldn't know the dude was hit. He was so calm. (laughs) I'm thinking, this is a lesson for someone like me who gets irritated in traffic, you know? Well, later on that year, he gets sent to the um, Auschwitz, right? And at Auschwitz, they had a rule. If someone within your bunker tried to escape, 10 people would be selected from that bunker at random and sent to a starvation chamber where they would starve and dehydrate to death. So, you know, that's a pretty good incentive if your friend John's like, I'm going to make a run for it. You're like, no, you're not. No, that's not going to happen, right? So it's a smart idea. But one day, a man did escape. And the God <clears throat> comes in and just starts listing off the numbers of these men. Remember, they had numbers attached to their chest. Maximilian Colby's was 16670, but his number didn't get called. So this guard just started listing off these names. Can you imagine if you were in their shoes and you had to just sort of step forward? You were one of the people. At one point, a guy by the name of Franciszek Gajewniczek, so if you're looking for baby names, got... Um, got called forward by his number, and he fell to his knees, and he just begged for mercy. This pitiful sight of this man who was saying, I've got a family, please spare me. At that moment, Maximilian Colby, whose number hadn't been called, steps forward. Ah. He goes up to the, uh, to the guard, and he says, and he's sick at this point, right? So he's like, I want to take his place. What do you say to that? The, the guard looks at him and says, why? Fair question, you know. And he said, he gave him an answer he knew he would accept. He said, look, he's a strong man and I'm, I'm old and sick and useless. The next question, who are you? He said, I'm a Catholic priest. Apparently the guard couldn't even speak and he just ushered the 10 down to the starvation bunker But Franciszek had these words to say when he survived Auschwitz and was at the canonization of Maximilian Kolbe. This is what he had to say. And this is in regard to, you know, the moment when Maximilian stepped up. He said this, quote, I could only thank him with my eyes. I was stunned and could hardly grasp what was going on the immensity of it. I, the condemned, am to live and someone else willingly and voluntarily offers his life for me, a stranger, 
is this some kind of dream? Apparently, the guard who shut the door said, you will all shrivel up like tulips, and he slammed that door. One of the guards who was in charge of emptying the urine and feces pan said that, that every morning, you know, the urine pan was empty because they were drinking it because they were dying. They were scratching the walls, eating the dirt, whatever they could as their bodies started to collapse and die. Now, usually, <clears throat> they were used to hearing screams, right, of terror and pleas for their life. So can you imagine how uh, shocked and maybe even annoyed they were to hear songs of praise? <laughs> songs to the Blessed Mother coming out of this thing. Maximilian Colby was hearing their confessions, preparing them for death. Duh. What a man. Isn't that awesome? Two weeks go by, and Maximilian, along with two or three others, are remaining, and they needed the cell for something else. So they came in, and Maximilian was slunched against, uh, slumped against the corner, and they gave him a lethal injection. Now, this was on the eve of the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Mother, and he looked up, and he said, Ave Maria. Final words as he was injected and died. Ugh! How do you become a man like that? I don't have like three easy steps, you know? I don't know actually. I really, I'm not here to tell, I don't know. It's not like, okay, follow these three steps, give me $19.95, buy my book and you too. I know, because I'm the dude who swims away from dolphins. <laughs> I, I want to, do you know what, I, like hear me when I say I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of man who can give his life away, not just in the big things, but in the small things, in the way that I love my wife, in the way I give my time to my kids and my friends. I want to be like that. And yet when I look at myself, I see so much weakness. But I know I want to be a strong man, as do you. Now, I think that one of the obstacles which so often prevents men from becoming who they deeply desire to be and the kinds of men God commands that they be are the lies that we believe. We just accept. Lies like this. And we would never say this out loud. Because if you said it out loud, you're like, oh, that's obviously not true. But it's somehow we believe it. Lies like, okay, well, God loves me, but He doesn't like me. He loves me in a kind of obligatory sense, but He doesn't delight in me lies about sex, right? Lies about women, lies about ourselves, what we're capable of. For me, the greatest lie that was inflicted upon me was the lie of pornography. At the age of eight, I was at a relative's house and my brother and I were out the back playing what we called Dirt Ronnie Wars. Now, I'll explain to you what a Dirt Ronnie is, right? In Minnesota, during the snow, right, you can have snowball fights, we don't have snow, most places in Australia. So what do you do? I was deprived of the delight of a snowball fight. That rhymed. So what we did is we would get this stuff called bull dust. It was like red dirt that was talcum powdered fine. You'd clump it together and it would make like a hard rock. And it's the same, you know, physics. The harder you pack it, the harder it is. The, hopefully he bleeds, right? And so we would just stay out there, dude, for hours. And my mom, I love my mom, man. She would actually kick us out of the house. She's like, all right, out you get, go on, play outside. She'd lock the door. I thought that was awful. Now I'm a parent, and I have done that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we would run out the back. Now, at one point, I ran into my relative, this relative, I won't say who it was, this relative's shed for cover. And there was a trunk in the corner of the shed. And it looked cool, man. It was like this old wooden trunk thing. So I opened it up, and I was rummaging around, and I came across a centerfold of a naked woman. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good. You look friendly. And um, I felt instantaneous feelings of um, wonder. You know, like, this is, this is really beautiful, you know? As my friend Jason never has pointed out, no one gets addicted to looking at pictures of waterfalls on the internet, you know? You would not go to a priest and go, I just can't help myself, the pictures of the rainbows. <laughs> They're so pretty, I just have to look at them. No, there's something, even double rainbows, right? There's something beautiful about 
the, the feminine form, right? So it was this sense of just awe, but this simultaneous sense of shame. I shouldn't be looking at this, and I know it. Not that anyone's ever told me it was wrong, but I know I shouldn't be doing this, so I shut it. <laughs> I was like, that was weird. And off I went to play with my brother. But as you can imagine, I developed quite a fascination for my relative's house. I was like, hey, mom, we should probably go visit, you know, old so-and-so, don't you think? Mom's like, what's up with you, Matthew? You never wanted to go see him before. And I'd be like, yeah, but he's getting old, you know, you never know how long we've got, so... That's awful. I'm guilt tripping my mum so I can go look at porn. And so, um, you know, we'd go to this place and I would find out that picture and other pictures that were stashed in other places and I would just look at them, you know. As I grew older, I became more sort of entrenched in this sin. And here's something that I like that's tweet worthy, all right? <laughs> the further entrenched in sin we are, the more rational insanity seems, yeah? The further entrenched in sin we are, the more rational insanity seems. We just start justifying stuff, man. It's fine, it's fine. Don't tell me I shouldn't be looking at it, I'm not hurting anybody. You know there's something up when you feel the need to justify something, don't you? I mean, no one is feeding the poor in Calcutta now and thinking to themselves, it's fine. It's not like I'm hurting anybody. Stop judging me. It's like, we're not judging you. Just pour the soup. What the heck? We only feel this need to justify something when we think there might be something wrong with it. To show you what I mean by this insanity, let me give you a quote from Playboy magazine. Now, this quote came from the, an edition in 1954. Okay? Quote, and by the way, I hope this makes you feel nauseous. It's not pleasant. All sophisticated playboys are interested in virginity. Most men realize that virginity is an unpleasant little matter to be disposed of early in life. In taking her virginity, you are actually doing the girl a service. Some may suggest that you're trying to deprive them of something, trying to take from them a, chi a cherished possession. But this is nonsense. Actually, you are giving them a freedom, a means of enjoying life more fully. Some difficulties have arisen because of the confusion in female minds between virginity and purity. The two have nothing to do with one another, and it's important that you point this out at the proper moment. Thus, thus, armed with our conviction, we are ready to begin. First, of course, we must select a suitable subject. Once we've found our subject, we are ready for the approach. Don't bother with non-virgins, because it robs you of the special pleasure of spreading the good news, and that, after all, is what this is all about. Ugh. Like, you have to be entrenched in sin for that to go, oh yeah, it makes sense. In 2010, Maxim Magazine ran an article, I believe it was in their May edition, or maybe March, and it was an article on how to cheat on your wife so her and the kids don't find out. And women actually, his, women gave you seven pointers. This is how to do it. You freaking kidding me? Like, I feel sick. I, this is not what authentic masculinity is, you know? But the further entrenched in sin we are, we're like, yeah, that, that starts to make sense. And this is where I was at, man. I started going to strip clubs, doing all sorts of stupid stuff. But while I was in Australia entrenched in sin, there was another man I want to tell you about. He was on the other side of the planet in Texas. His name was uh, Chuck, or Charlie. But whenever I say Charlie, people go, bit my finger. So just don't. His name was Charlie. Now, Charlie, who I now know, he works for Focus, great guy, but at the time he was like 16, and Charlie was a, a Catholic Christian, you know, and he, he, he didn't drink, he was underage, but he was a great guy, and one day he's at this house party, the parents weren't there, and people had gotten trashed, had drunk way more than they should have, and one of his friends was standing in the corner, and she had drunk way more than she had expected to that night. And as he's watching her, he sees another guy approach her, start laying on the moves, and 
link arms, and they begin walking towards the stairs where they were going to go up to the second floor. So Charlie steps up. He walks up to the guy. He's like, what are you doing? And the guy's like, what what do you think I'm doing? I'm going upstairs to the bedroom, back off. This is what Charlie did, and I wish I was there to have witnessed it. He got his finger, and he put it in his chest, and he just said four words. He said, that will not happen. Now, however he said it, the dude dropped the girl's arm, and he backed off. Charlie then took that girl, walked her upstairs, and laid her in the bed. He then walked outside and closed the door and literally laid across the threshold, dragged the pillow out and slept there that night. Why? Because if anyone wanted to come for her, dude, they got to get through me first. Can you imagine the profound respect I have for Charlie when I tell you that that girl is now my wife? And that, um, you know, my wife would not have been a virgin on our wedding night if Charlie hadn't just stood up and been a man, you know? But I don't want to make it seem like I'm being too crude to that other guy who I want to slap. Um, you know, the idiot. I don't want to make it seem like I'm being too unfair to the idiot. But um, no, just being joking. And the reason I don't want to make it seem like that is because I've been in his shoes, right? It is really easy to give in to sexual temptation. Why? Because it only requires giving in. It requires nothing of you. No strength is required. You just have to give in. There's nothing difficult about it. But honestly, even if I forget my whole Christian religion thing, forget it, I know in my heart I don't want to be like him, you know? I want to be like Charlie. Cameron, uh, when we were, we were dating right before we got engaged, she was telling me this story as we were driving over to his youth group, and she's telling me like it's no big deal. I'm in the corner tearing up, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, all right, yeah, good. And I get there expecting to find Rambo, and great guy, uh, Charlie Mercer is his name, he's was doing missionary work for Focus, but yeah, he's a skinny kind of guy, you know, like kind of had kind of thicker glasses at the time, and you know, like. But he stood up. He embraced his masculinity, dude. Don't we want to be like that? Now, maybe as you sit here today, or as you've been here throughout the conference, you're aware that the person you are is not who you want to be. There are patterns of sin in your life that need to be gotten rid of. You know you need to grow up. You know that a lot of the time you might be acting like a freaking boy. And God is calling you and he's calling me. It doesn't matter how old you are, man. I'm 30 years old and I act like a boy. He's calling us to grow up, to embrace authentic masculinity. And sometimes it's discouraging, right? Listen to the words of John Paul II. At World Youth Day in 2002 in Toronto, he said this. You are not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. You are the sum of the Father's love for you and your real capacity to be like His Son, Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Five rules that every man needs to break. You ready? Number one, never get into a fight. People tell you that growing up. Let me tell you about the first fight I ever got into. I was 13 years old, and I had just made the catastrophic shift from primary school to high school. And when I moved to high school, a lot of the people from the public schools came over because their parents wanted to give them a Catholic education but didn't want to pay the whole thing, which is fair enough. It was ridiculously overpriced. And, you know, we from the Catholic school, we were all pretty convinced that the public school kids smoked pot and worshipped Satan. We weren't sure, but it was a strong hunch. So we were all a little nervous about the public school kids, you know. First day, I'm in an English class, and this kid, his name was Mark. Mark? He looked at me, and he said, Oi, I want to fight you. Actually, he was 13, so he went, Oi, I want to fight you. 
And I said, why? Why? <laughs> he said, I don't like you. I said, fair enough. When do you want to fight? He's like, today, after school at the park. And I sized him up, and I was like, I can definitely take you. Yes, let's do it, you know? And so I'm pumping myself up, you know? <laughs> like, if I had Karate Kid, I would have went home and watched it. <laughs> you know? Oh, I have the ta- That's a different movie. That's all right. So I go to the park. Like this. Except I'm 13. And um, he didn't show up. So I think to myself, that's okay, I'll just go to his house. Idiot. I'm 13, my frontal lobe hadn't fully developed, which was kind of necessary for making good judgments. So I'm like, I'll just go to his house. So I went to his house. Never occurred to me what would happen if his mum answered the door, but never mind. I knock on his door. And Mark answers it. And he runs right past me. It was the weirdest thing. Hey there. And he ran into the next lot next to his house. There wasn't another house there. It was a park surrounded by trees and shrubbery. Okay? (laughs) I love that word. So I follow him over there, you know? But when I get to the, the entrance of this park, about seven seniors walk out. So he had planned this. Oh, poopy. And, you know, they're not happy people, either these seniors. Like, one of these seniors is, I think, currently in prison. And if he's not, he just recently got released. Like, they were bad news, you know. And they're like, we want to see a fight. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh, I I don't really want to fight him. He asked me, you know, like, I don't care. We want to see a fight. All right, yeah. They started pushing us into each other. And I didn't know what to do. So all I did was I just threw my foot up. I didn't know if I made a connection or not. <laughs> but when I did that, I guess some people were like, whoa, and there was a break in the circle, and I ran out, and I got on my BMX, and I rode all the way home. And I'll be honest, man, I was crying. I was just so um, pumped up, you know, with adrenaline, and I was like, I just ran away from a fight on the first day of high school. I'm going to be made fun of until I leave high school. This is not good. In the morning, I'm like, hey, mum, <coughs> I'm really sick, eh? Can I stay home? No. All right, no worries. Got the backpack on, went to school. I was standing by the lockers, ready for the abuse. Um, Here's what's funny, though. I guess I had made contact. (laughs) So this is how the story spread around my school. Yeah, so that frag kid, man, I mean, we we were there, and all of a sudden, he just kicked him in the face. And he's like, I'm done here. And he just walked off. That's what they're saying, Matt. Is that, is that what happened? I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Give or take, yeah, sounds a bit right. You're welcome. True story. Now, what I'm not meaning by we need to break this rule is I, I'm not saying that after this talk, we're going to get up, make mama jokes, and punch each other in the face. You know, like, No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is we need to be manly and we need to fight And I'll just focus on two things. I think the one thing we need to do is we need to fight for the dignity of women. Amen? Look around, brothers. I mean, if you don't do it, if you're not committed to this task, who do you think out there is? Do you think that there's people out there somewhere who are dedicated that you just don't know? Maybe, probably not. You're it, right? In the way we look at them, in the way we speak about them, in the way we speak to them, in, in the way we allow others to speak about them. Secondly, we need to fight for our faith. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, St. Peter, our first pope, says, always be ready to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Do you know how to defend the faith? Do you know how to give reasons for what you believe? You know our faith is reasonable, Vatican I defined as infallible that we can know by the faculty of reason alone that God exists, that God's beautiful, things like this, right? A couple of websites I want to point you to. One, if you have questions in the regards to atheism and Christianity, go to strangenotions.com. A good friend of mine just started that up, strangenotions.com. If you've got questions about like, stuff of a Catholic nature, go to our site, catholic.com did you get that catholic.com it's difficult yeah it's the second most visited website after the vatican's which we're totally cool with 
Catholic.com. Check that out, man. Pour yourself a coffee and just spend like an hour or two just researching stuff and learning the faith. The second rule we need to break, never think about sex. (laughs) Frank Sheed once said that modern man practically never thinks about sex. Now, you might be thinking, well, Frank Sheed never met me, but uh, what does he mean, okay? Well, what he means, I think, is we dream about sex, we joke about sex, we write songs about sex, some of us are classy enough to graffiti about sex in the boys' bathrooms, right? Honor students. But how many of us sit back and think about sex? Like, it's nature. What is it? What is it? What's its purpose? I think many of us are under the illusion that maybe Cosmopolitan Magazine came up with sex, you know, or something. No. You want to know who came up with sex? Look to the very first commandment in the Bible Gen- to humanity. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. He says, be fruitful and multiply. And as Peter Kraft has pointed out, I do not think he meant grow oranges and invent calculators. No. Be fruitful and multiply. He meant, all right, get it on, have some babies. Let's do this. It's a beautiful thing. So sex is beautiful and it is sacred and it is good. I want to encourage you to re-educate yourself on the beauty of human sexuality. For so many of us, it has become something that's forbidden or bad or dirty or something, but what God has in store for us is better than any of us can possibly imagine, and it's beautiful. Our website is chastity.com. You can check that out, chastity.com. Number three, third rule every man needs to break. I think it's this, man. And this is going to sound a little weird, but play it safe. We have too many men in our culture who just just play in it safe. When I came back from Rome in World Youth Day in 2000, after I had my conversion from kind of agnosticism, I guess, to Catholicism, I was pretty amped, eh, about the faith. I would talk to Jesus about to, to about Jesus to anybody, you know. And my dad was like, "Mate, you just got to calm down, mate. Okay, just you know, it's good you found Jesus and this stuff, but just don't go too overboard. Now nah, bollocks, go overboard, you know. There should be people in your circles. And what, but when I say overboard, I don't mean be stupid or kind of like quoting the catechism 24 hours a day. But man, we've got to go out on a limb. Some of you are being called to full-time missionary work after your year in high school. Maybe net ministries, maybe focus. There's definitely men in here, many of you I'm sure, or some of you who are being called to the priesthood. And I want to encourage you just to make that decision. Let me tell you a truth. There are many Catholic men in this country, I'm talking about the good ones, that use discernment as an excuse for idleness. Since discernment became fashionable, says Father Bob Bedard, no one's made a decision since. I'm oh, just discerning. All right, well, how about you stop and make a decision? Discernment's good, but we need to man up and make a decision. The fourth rule we need to break, never give in to peer pressure. You know, when I was a kid, I was terrible at basketball. But so long as I was playing on my own, I was like Michael Jordan. I don't know if you ever did this, but I'd be out the back, you know, like 10 years old. I'd be like, three, two, one, and I'd miss. I'd be like, one, three, two, come on, you bugger, one, yeah, you know. I was like, dude, I am, I am really good, man. You know, I don't, you know, I don't want to speak too soon, but an NBA career may not be impossible. And then I'd play with my brother, who was younger than me. I'm like, I'm still pretty good, you know. I'm like Michael Jordan with the common cold, you know. But I'm, I'm really good. And then I'd play with my friends at school. I'm like, I'm like Michael Jordan, who sprained both of his hands. <laughs> The point is, man, when we surround ourselves with people who aren't walking the faith, aren't living the faith, it's easy for us to think, dude, I am a saint. I may as well start my own canonization process right now. But when we have good peer pressure, when we're surrounding ourselves with brothers who love Jesus Christ, who are striving for purity, then we realize how much we need to grow. So I want to encourage you to, be, to peer pressure each other into being saints. Uh, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, you should look him up, 
he would play pool with his friends at the pool hall. And he'd say, okay, if you beat me, I'll give you money. But if I beat you, you have to come to Eucharistic adoration with me. <laughs> That's good peer pressure, you know. Finally, never ask directions. <laughs> All right, listen up. I know that men are supposed to be good with directions. I'm not. I have been emasculated by my iPhone, which is now a feminine electronic voice giving me directions. I'm hopeless. A couple of years ago, I was living in Canada in Ottawa, and my wife and I were going to the Science Museum for kids. And she's like, do you know how to get there? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're driving. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, it's just around here somewhere. No worries. True story. I'm not making this up to make you like me more. This is what happened. I drove into Quebec. That's the next province. <laughs> and the reason I knew that is Quebec is a French-speaking state, and there were French road signs. <laughs> Manhood <laughs> to the groin. And so my wife is like, should we, do, you, do you think we should ask directions now? I'm like, yeah, maybe. All right. I think as men, sometimes like we have these desires and we want to be good and we want to be holy and all of a sudden we think we have it together and we start to see French road signs. And we need to ask directions. And the beautiful thing about being Catholic is that we belong to the church which Christ established. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, we read about the Israelites who were guided by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so you might think to yourself, well, that's terrific for them. Where's the pillar now to guide us? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, St. Paul says, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. When we listen to the church, we cannot go wrong. When we listen to the church, we are listening to the voice of Christ. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to ask direction in the sacrament of confession. At 5 p.m. today, there's going to be the sacrament of confession available. And if you haven't gone, go. All right, I'm gonna, I want to just tell you one thing here, which I think is really important because I wish I knew it. The church teaches that if you go to the sacrament of confession and you willfully hold back a mortal sin, all right? killed your brother or something. And you're like, I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to say that. I'll say the rest. Church teaches that none of the sins have been forgiven. Here's the good news though, on the other side. If after an examination of conscience, you go into the sacrament of confession and confess the mortal sin, number and kind, to the best of your ability, without intentionally withholding anything, all has been forgiven. All has been forgiven. You walk out of that confession, you remember something that was mortal, it's been forgiven. Now, we approach the sacrament and say, I forgot to confess this last time, and, but to know it's been forgiven. Beautiful, the freedom we have as Catholics. I want to close by telling you a story about um, a guy by the name of Vitalis. He's now a saint in the Catholic Church. Vitalis of Gaza is his name. You've got to Google him. Vitalis of Gaza was a monk who each day would walk into town and hire himself out as a day laborer. At the end of each day, he would collect the money and then go to a different prostitute <laughs> each night, but not to use her. Rather, he would pay her so she would spend the night with him so she wouldn't have to be used. And rather than exploiting her, he would proclaim the gospel to her. One day, Vitalis was walking out of a brothel, a house of prostitution, and a fellow Christian saw him and was outraged at this monk coming out of a brothel. That, in good Christian charity, smacked him over the head with something, I don't know. But Vitalis began to bleed and hobbled back to his cave, and he died there. When they buried his body, there was a candle-lit procession of women who had left prostitution and women who were still in prostitution to honor the man who was able to see their dignity even when they themselves were not. 